All right. <clears throat> We're getting near the end of the introduction here um, to Spengler's uh, Decline of the West. I do want to point out that uh, anyone, I, I think that um, anyone who wants a, a look at what uh, these Roman world cities were like and what Rome itself was like in its most decadent period should watch the PBS series I, Claudius, which is based on a novel by Robert Graves, which in turn is based on Tacitus's uh, very close historical accounts of uh, Tiberius, who comes right after Augustus, uh, Tiberius and Nero and Claudius. Um, it's a chronicle of depravity. Um, Claudius is, uh, became Roman emperor almost by accident. He was a scholar. Uh, he had a limp, uh, and so he was a social outcast, but he had royal blood, so he was part of the family. Uh, and he had a wife named Messalina. Messalina was the biggest whore in Rome. She would have fucking contests where she would lie on a pedestal, and this, this shows it in, P, in the PBS show, where she's lying on a pedestal uh, with her legs open and a line of men going around the block uh, to take turns fucking her, and she would have fucking contests with another whore to see how, how many dicks that, that they could take, and they just keep going and going and going. Messalina reminds me of, of someone I, I once knew. I won't say who, but uh, <laughs> uh, I've known a Messalina. Um, Believe me, um, it's not a pretty picture. But yeah, I Claudius is, is fantastic. Um, anything by Robert Graves is high quality. His Greek myths is the best analysis of Greek mythology I've ever encountered. It's spectacular. He was a greater classicist, I think, even than Karl Karenyi. And Karl Karenyi was one of the, the great uh, classicists uh, with whom Thomas Mann corresponded as he was working on the mythic aspects of his great tetralogy, Joseph and His Brothers, which at some point I'd like to read on here. Okay, let's keep going here, and just through sheer inertia we'll get through this. <laughs> it's going to take a while, but... So we're up to subsection 13, and we've been considering the difference in temperament between the, the man of culture and the man of civil, civilization. Okay. Considered in itself, the Roman world dominion was a negative phenomenon, being the result not of a surplus of energy on, one, on the one side that the Romans had never had since Zama, but of a deficiency of resistance on the other. That the Romans did not conquer the world is certain. They merely took possession of a booty that lay open to everyone. The Imperium Romanum came into existence not as the result of such an extremity of military and financial effort as it characterized the Punic Wars, but because the Old East forewent all external self-determinations. We must not be deluded by the appearance of brilliant military successes. With a few ill-trained, ill-led, and solemn legions, Lucullus and Pompey conquered whole realms, a phenomenon that in the period of the Battle of Ipsus would have been unthinkable. These worlds, I guess, were just all tired and worn out. Uh, the Northern Rim, uh, the Rim of North Africa, the Middle East, Asia Minor, these peoples were all worn out by the Carthaginian Wars. Uh, the Mithridatic danger, serious enough for a system of material force which had never been put to any real test, would have been nothing to the conquerors of Hannibal. After Zama, the Romans never again waged or were capable of waging a war against the great military power. Their classic wars were those against the Samnites, Pyrrhus, and Carthage. Their great hour was Cani. To maintain the heroic posture for centuries on end is beyond the power of any people. The Prussian German people have had three great moments, 1813, 1870, in 1914, and that is more than others have had. Here then, I lay it down that imperialism, of which petrifacts such as the Egyptian Empire, the Roman, the Chinese, the Indian, may continue to exist for hundreds or thousands of years. Dead bodies, amorphous and dispirited masses of men, scrap material from a great history, is to be taken as the typical symbol of the passing away. So the universal state uh, which is Toynbee's term for what he's talking about here, the, the Roman Imperium, can go on in a state of suspended decrepitude basically forever. Uh, it just ossifies, dies a slow death through ossification, as Borkenau called it, uh, unless, as Borkenau said, it's disrupted and its head is chopped off by barbarian invasions or another society, such as the Ottomans uh, devouring the Byzantine Empire, uh, gobbling it up. It can just go on forever, and basically that's the case with India and China today. These are cultures that have just simply lasted forever through sheer inertia. 
<clears throat> Imperialism is civilization unadulterated. In this phenomenal form, the destiny of the West is now irrevocably set. The energy of culture man is directed inwards, that of civilization man outwards. And thus I see, in Cecil Rhodes, the first man of a new age. He stands for the political style of a far-ranging Western Teutonic and especially German future, and his phrase, expansion is everything, is the Napoleonic reassertion of the indwelling tendency of every civilization that has fully ripened, Roman, Arab, or Chinese. It is not a matter of choice. It is not the conscious will of individuals, or even that of whole classes or peoples that decides. The expansive tendency is a doom, something demonic and immense, which grips forces into service and uses up the late mankind of the world city stage willy-nilly, aware or unaware. There's a footnote here that says, The modern Germans are a conspicuous example of a people that has become expansive without knowing it or willing it. They were already in that state while they still believed themselves to be the people of Goethe. Even Bismarck, the founder of the New Age, never had the slightest idea of it and believed himself to have reached the conclusion of a political process. Wait till you see what Hitler does. You ain't seen nothing yet, Spengler. <laughs> Life is the process of affecting possibilities, and for the brain man, there are only extensive possibilities. Hard as the half-developed socialism of today is fighting against expansion, one day it will become arch-expansionist with all the vehemence of destiny. Here the form language of politics is the direct intellectual expression of a certain type of humanity touches on a deep metaphysical problem. On the fact, affirmed in the grant of unconditional validity to the causality principle, that the soul is the complement of its extension. When between 480 and 230 BC, the Chinese group of states was tending towards imperialism, it was entirely futile to combat the principle of imperialism, practiced in particular by the Roman state of Qin, that's Qin, Qin Shi Huangdi is the emperor then who comes in 200 BC and conquers and unifies all of China and creates the Qin dynasty after which China is named and theoretically represented by the philosopher Shang Yi by ideas of a league of nations largely derived from Wang Hu, a profound skeptic who had no illusions as to the men or the political possibilities of this late period. Both sides opposed the anti-political idealism of Lao Tzu, uh, but as between themselves it was Len Hang and not Ho Tsung which swam with the natural current of expansive uh, civilization. Most of these Chinese philosophers are obscure to me. I don't know them. Um, huh, interesting. Rhodes is to be regarded as the first precursor of a Western type of Caesar, whose day is to come, yet, uh, whose day is to come though yet distant. He stands midway between Napoleon and the force men of the next centuries, just as Flaminius, who from 232 B.C. onward, pressed the Romans to undertake the subjugation of Cisalpine Gaul, and so initiated the policy of colonial expansion, stands between Alexander and Caesar. Between Alexander and Caesar. Alexander is the first uh, expansive type, as Napoleon is, and then down to Caesar, who is the next expansive type, who actually creates the empire. Um, he sees this guy Cecil Rhodes, whom I don't know anything about, really, uh, conqueror of South Africa, I suppose, as a, a forerunner of the type. Strictly speaking, Flaminius was a private person, for his real power was of a kind not embodied in any constitutional office, who exercised a dominant influence in the state at a time when the state idea was giving way to the pressure of economic factors. So far as Rome is concerned, he was the archetype of opposition Caesarism. Uh, with him there came to an end the idea of state service. And there began the will to power, which ignored traditions and reckoned only with forces. Alexander and Napoleon were romantics. Though they stood on the threshold of civilization and in its cold, clear air, the one fancied himself an Achilles and the other read Werther. Caesar, on the contrary, was a pure man of fact, gifted with immense understanding. But even for Rhodes, political success means territorial and financial success, and only that. Of this Romanness within himself, he was fully aware but Western civilization has not yet taken shape in such strength and purity as this. It was only before his maps that he could fall into a sort of poetic trance, this son of the parsonage who, sent out to South Africa without means, made a gigantic fortune and employed it as the engine of political aims. His idea of a trans-African railway from the Cape to Cairo, his project of a South African empire, his intellectual hold on the hard metal souls of the mining magnates 
his wealth he forced into the service of his schemes. His capital, Bulawayo, royally planned as a future residence by a statesman who was all-powerful, yet stood in no definite relation to the state, his wars, his diplomatic deals, his road systems, his syndicates, his armies, his conception of the great duty to civilization of the man of brain. All this, broad and imposing, is the prelude of a future which is still in store for us, and with which the history of West European mankind will be definitely closed. He who does not understand that this outcome is obligatory and insusceptible of modification, that our choices between willing this and willing nothing at all, between cleaving to this destiny or despairing of the future and of life itself, he who cannot feel that there is grandeur also in the realizations of powerful intelligences and the energy and discipline of metal-hard natures, in battles fought with the coldest and most abstract means, he who is obsessed with the idealism of a provincial and world and would pursue the ways of life of past ages must forgo all desire to comprehend history, to live through history, or to make history. Thus regarded, the Imperium Romanum appears no longer as an isolated phenomenon, but as the normal product of a strict and energetic, megalopolitan, predominantly practical spirituality, as typical of a final and irreversible condition which has occurred often enough, though it has only been identified as such in this instance. Let it be realized, then, that the secret of historical form does not lie on the surface, that it cannot be grasped by means of similarities of costume and setting, and that in the history of men, as in that of animals and plants, there occur phenomena showing deceptive similarity, but inwardly without any connection, e.g. Charlemagne and Harun al-Rashid, Alexander and Caesar, the German wars upon Rome, and the Mongol onslaughts upon West Europe, and other phenomena of extreme outward dissimilarity, but of identical import, e.g. Trajan and Ramses II, the Bourbons and the Attic Demos, Mohammed and Pythagoras. <laughs> that the 19th and 20th centuries hitherto looked on as the highest point of an ascending straight line of world history are in reality a stage of life which may be observed in every culture that has ripened to its limit, a stage of life characterized not by socialists, impressionists, electric railways, torpedoes, and differential equations, for these are only body constituents of the time, but by a civilized spirituality which possesses not only these, but also quite other creative possibilities, that as our own time represents a transitional phase which occurs with certainty under particular conditions, there are perfectly well-defined states, such as have occurred more than once in the history of the past later than the present day state of West Europe, and therefore that the future of the West is not a limitless tending upwards and onwards for all time towards our present ideals, but a single phenomenon of history, strictly limited and defined as to form and duration, which covers a few centuries and can be viewed and in essentials calculated from available precedents. Um, so, there is no future for the West other than as uh, a civilization, or what Toynbee would call a universal state, governed by money as its primary ruling force, and then by the brutality of forced politics uh, by men who uh, are not particularly affiliated with this or that party, but simply are, uh, like Cecil Rhodes, men of force and resources uh, and talent, uh, an organization who can come in and take control of the situation. Uh, given, let's say, a state of emergency, as was the case with Sulla, um, when he took, assumed full powers as a dictator, declared a state of emergency permanently, and remained a permanent dictator. He's the first to do this. Um, so let's move on to subsection 14. Let's see, we've got 15... 16. So there are 16 subsections. We go up to page 50. Now we're on page 39. So, so we're getting somewhere. We're, we're making progress. It's like climbing a mountain reading this thing. It's like, okay, where are we getting? Then we have to stop and look back and say, actually, we have made some progress. Um, this high plane of contemplation once attained, <laughs> that's what I was just saying. Uh, the rest is easy. To this single idea one can refer, and by it one can solve, uh, without straining or forcing, all those separate problems of religion, art history, epistemology, ethics, politics, economics, with which the modern intellect has so passionately and so vainly busied itself for decades. This idea is one of those truths that have only to be expressed with full clarity to become indisputable. 
It is one of the inward necessities of the Western culture and of its world feeling. It is capable of entirely transforming the world outlook of one who fully understands it, i.e. makes it intimately his own. It immensely deepens the world picture, natural and necessary to us, in that, already trained to regard world historical evolution as an organic unit seen backwards from our standpoint in the present, we are enabled by its aid to follow the broad lines into the future, a privilege of dream calculation till now permitted only to the physicist. It is, I repeat, in effect, the substitution of a Copernican for a Ptolemaic aspect of history that is an immeasurable widening of horizon. <laughs> Up to now, everyone has been at liberty to hope what he pleased about the future, where there are no facts, sentiment, rules, but henceforward it will be every man's business to inform himself of what can happen, and therefore of what, with the unalterable necessity of destiny, and irrespective of personal ideals, hopes, or desires, will happen. When we use the risky word freedom, we shall mean freedom to do, not this or that, but the necessary or nothing. The feeling that this is just as it should be is the hallmark of the man of fact. To lament it and blame it is not to alter it. To birth belongs death, to youth, age, to life, generally its form and its allotted span. The present is a civilized, emphatically not a cultured time, and ipso facto a great number of life capacities fall out as impossible. This may be deplorable, and may be and will be deplored in pessimist philosophy and poetry, but it is, it is not in our power to make otherwise. It will not be, already it is not, permissible to defy clear historical experience and to expect merely because we hope that this will spring or that will flourish. It will no doubt be objected that such a world outlook, which in giving this certainty as to the outlines and tendency of the future, cuts off all far-reaching hopes, would be unhealthy for all and fatal for many once it ceased to be a mere theory and was adopted as a practical scheme of life by the group of personalities effectively molding the future. Such is not my opinion. We are civilized, not Gothic or Rococo people. We have to reckon with the hard, cold facts of a late life to which the parallel is to be found not in Pericles' Athens, but in Caesar's Rome. Of great painting or great music, there can no longer be. <laughs> For Western people, any question. Their architectural possibilities have been exhausted these hundred years. Only extensive possibilities are left to them. Yet for a sound and vigorous generation that is filled with unlimited hopes, I fail to see that it is any disadvantage to discover betimes that some of these hopes must come to nothing. And if the hopes thus doomed should be those most dear, well, a man who is worth anything will not be dismayed. It is true that the issue may be a tragic one, for some individuals who, in their decisive years, are overpowered by the conviction that in the spheres of architecture, drama, painting, there is nothing left for them to conquer. What matter if they do go under? It has been the convention hitherto to admit no limits of any sort in these matters, and to believe that each period had its own task to do in each sphere. Tasks, therefore, were found by Hook or by Crook, leaving it to be settled posthumously whether or not the artist's faith was justified and his life work necessary. Now nobody but a pure romantic would take this way out. Such a pride is not the pride of a Roman. What are we to think of the individual who, standing before an exhausted quarry, would rather be told that a new vein will be struck tomorrow, the bait offered by the radically false and mannerized art of the moment, than be shown a rich and virgin clay bed nearby? The lesson, I think, would be of benefit to the coming generations, as showing them what is possible and therefore necessary, and what is excluded from the inward potentialities of their time. Hitherto, an incredible total of intellect and power has been squandered in false directions. The West European, however historically he may think and feel, is at a certain stage of life invariably uncertain of his own direction. He grows and feels his way, and if unlucky in environment, he loses it. But now at last, the work of centuries enables him to view the disposition of his own life in relation to the general culture scheme and to test his own powers and purposes. And I can only hope that men of the new generation may be moved by this book to devote themselves to techniques instead of lyrics, the sea instead of the paintbrush, and politics instead of epistemology. Better they could not do. <laughs> so he has this sweeping damnation and condemning of the arts as now worthless undertakings. Uh, you're better off picking up the crescent wrench than the paintbrush. You'll have better results and you'll have a more satisfying life uh, because there are more possibilities, extensive possibilities in the realm of technics than there are in the intensive realm of metaphysics and art. Well, be that as it may, 
Uh, he's most decidedly wrong about this. Um, there are plenty of things that you can do as an artist, all kinds of great creative possibilities in this civilization that we're in now. Uh, he's totally wrong about this, and Gene Gebser really needs to be brought in as the supplement to, to Spengler's pessimism. Uh, Gebser picks up the challenge, let's say in a Toynbean model, uh, Spengler is the challenge, to which Gebser is the response in his book Ever Present Origin, where he sees modernism, modernist art, and basically the whole book is about, uh, it's a peon to modernist art and thinking. Uh, as a whole new structure of consciousness, not a decline, but a new structure of consciousness, which he calls the integral, also a perspectival uh, consciousness structure, the integral consciousness structure that is capable of taking all the earlier consciousness structures, the tribal magical, uh, the civilizational mythical, um, the, the rational mental consciousness structure, taking them all up and integrating them into a single integrum, a kind of sphere to which... Um, one can access any one of them at any time that one wants, and that we are at a stage in our civilization with a new structure of consciousness that enables us to do this. Um, the arts of modernism gets or sees as a complete revelation. For example, the hyperdimensional object that is made visible in the paintings of the Cubists, uh, Picasso and Juan Gris and all of these guys, um, Bala's dog on a leash, these guys are all painting a hyperdimensional object that only exists in a metaphysical phase space that is not apparent to the five senses. Spengler missed this completely. He was as ignorant of the greatness of modernist art as Carl Jung was, who also missed it, and probably also Rudolf Steiner. I don't think he got it either. These men are my all-time favorite thinkers, but they didn't get the essence of the greatness of modernist art. And consequently, neither are they going to get the, the greatness of hypermodern art or postmodern art. Um, postmodern art produced all kinds of great artists, uh, such as Anselm Kiefer and Anish Kapoor and Damien Hirst, um, one great artist after the next. But their greatness is something, like he says, uh, they're the type of artist who only appeals to a very small, elite, megalopolitan consciousness who understands and can grasp them. It's a very small elite. It's not as in olden days where all the art and all the philosophy was meant for everyone, including every hamlet, every town, every village. Um, those days are long since gone. So he's got that much right. Uh, but I've done a whole series on contemporary art where I went through and I examined it, and a lot of contemporary art, he's right, is, is crap, just garbage, worthless stuff, and is aware of its own worthlessness in postmodernism and kind of celebrates its worthlessness uh, which is too bad. But uh, certainly artists of the caliber of Joseph Boyce, let's say, or Paul Tech, uh, these guys are incredible. They, they are geniuses. Shove Spangler aside so that you can appreciate the, the amazingness of these postmodern artists. And then, of course, hypermodernity has its own great artists, um, writers, and poets. Uh, so forget what Spangler says about the arts. Even while, as, but uh, on, on the other hand, I think his model is correct. Even while the civilization is declining and coming thundering down like in a, a slow motion collapse of a, you know, like a giant ship in a Star Wars movie, let's say, one of those great imperial triangular shaped cruisers, it's like a slow motion collapse. But in this slow motion collapse, plenty of great artists possible. There are plenty of, every age needs artists. And Heidegger understood this better than Spengler, that every single age needs artists. And if you don't have art and artists, uh, you're in big trouble. Um, so he's, he's a little off kilter here. Um, it sounds like it to me he had no appreciation for, let's say, Virgil or any of the Roman great poets. Uh, there are plenty of great ones. Juvenal, um, Petronius, uh, Apollius with the Golden Ass. Um, there are lots of great, uh, great Roman poets and artists. Uh, Ovid with the Metamorphoses. Fantastic stuff. Um, but he quietly overlooks all that and only wants to see the disintegration and decadence, and he emphasizes that. So don't listen to him when he says, there's, if you want to be a great artist in the civilization phase, there's nothing for you to do. That's ridiculous and dead wrong. For that, we need to switch to Heidegger, where Heidegger sees art, uh, every age having its own window of being that is established for it by the artist. The artist is the architect of being, 
uh, language is the house of being, and so it's very important for the artist to uh, establish an arrightness event in which being is understood in a new way through the arts. And it's only through the arts that new understandings of being come about. It doesn't come from civilizational industrial men, from Donald Trump types, or those guys. You're not going to get any kind of understanding of being from those men. You have to have the great artists. And Heidegger has this model that we're in an age of, of the other beginning. He says the first beginning was with the pre-Socratics all the way down to Nietzsche. That's the metaphysical age. But right now we're in a kind of chisura between two ages, the first beginning and the other beginning. Uh, right now we're looking for the last god, he says in his book, The Contributions. The last god is only a god can save us, uh, which will found a new religion. New religions always make new creative possibilities. So Spengler is overlooking the possibility that an internal proletariat underneath all of this uh, may establish a new religion, and a new religion automatically means new artistic possibilities, brand new ones, all kinds of stuff, just as Christianity came in as an internal proletariat and established the, first the art of the catacombs, which admittedly isn't, isn't great art at all, um, but it's terrible conditions sitting in a dark world with a lantern and stinking bodies all around you, you're going to want to get in there, make a painting, and get out as quickly as you can. So <laughs> the art of the catacombs isn't, isn't very good for that reason. Uh, but it establishes and founds Christian art, which then takes off from that point on. Um, so Spangler overlooks all kinds of things. He's, he's right, but he's not right. Um, you have to see in what ways he is right. Yes, we are living in a megalopolitan age uh, that is soulless, hyper-intellectual, and is dying. Uh, but we need our artists. Uh, we, we need as many of them as we can have to fight this kind of soulless decadence. Um, only an artist can save us, as far as I'm concerned. I would modify Heidegger's statement to that point. Only an artist can save us. Uh, whether that's a literary artist or a visual artist, uh, doesn't matter. Only an artist can save us. The arts are where everything is at. So he's decidedly wrong here. So you have to read Spengler uh, carefully, skeptically, uh, and see where he's right and see where he's wrong.